everyone. This is Melissa Sweet, public health journalist from Croaky Blog, and I'm sitting in South Headland with Julie Walker, and we're about to talk um, about the Just Justice Project, which is all about finding uh, community-led solutions to stop the over-incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Julie, could you just begin um, by introducing yourself and where we are and um, setting a little bit of context, I guess, for the discussion? Okay, so um, my name is Julie Walker, Julie, my maiden name is Julie Tommy, and um, I'm an Inawonga woman from the Pilbara um, region, um, it's around near the Ashburton Fubawar area, and I uh, live and work in the Pilbara at the Pilbara Language Centre. Great. Mm. and. You know, as, as I mentioned, Just Justice is all about telling stories with the idea of getting change, mm. finding solutions to stop the over-incarceration of people. So could you give us a little bit about your sort of background and history, interest in this issue? Um, <clears throat> well, my interest in the issues, I've been, we've been involved in social justice for a long time. Um, initially, um, when we um, first um, set up, we set up a we had a um, um, social Aboriginal social justice um, group, predominantly Aboriginal women. Um, but in the Pilbara, we uh, helped establish um, the um, what is now the uh, Pilbara Community Legal Service. Um, but you know, part of the reason behind that was to deal with the um, um, the um, level of um, um, social, well, not just um, you know the imprisonment rate, but to deal with the um, issues around policing and around um, just um, social justice issues um, facing Aboriginal people in the region. So, um, like I mentioned before, I got a social work background, but um, historically, um, like if you look at Aboriginal history, you see that Aboriginal people were um, subject to a uh, really tremendous violence from the onslaught of the first settlers. And um, more recently, we've been doing some studies around the hidden histories about massacres around the Pilbara region, and that's done through here through Bongamaya. Um, but to understand how Aboriginal people have um, become, I suppose, criminals in their own country, um, you need to understand the history of colonisation prior to colonisation, you know, the, the idea that Aboriginal people would be, you know, classified as um, probably one of the um, main groups of prison or offenders. Um, we, there's no, you know, there's no word for offenders or prisoners in Aboriginal language, so we didn't do, you know, we certainly didn't classify people like that. Um, but if you look at the early onset, you see that they're in that, um, you know, in the um, in the fight for land and um, um, and uh, resources, Aboriginal people were um, sent to um, were imprisoned through the uh, what was then the native welfare system. So they had these native welfare police, and um, some time ago, you might come across an article that um, Ian Blair did. Actually, he was um, he's a um, renowned. Um, uh, native welfare. He was a native welfare police, but he talked about how it was really for their own good that people got um, sent away in prison and so forth. But um, he taught um, he, uh, native welfare police went into the communities and actually initially um, they, you know, part of their role was to actually steal children. So that was how the, you know, the theft of Aboriginal children started. Um, but they were also responsible for. Um, the incarceration of Aboriginal prisoners and people, you know, they're classified as offenders. And in my family, um, there's an incident can, um, uh, around a place called uh, what we call um, Cop and, Cop and Poo, and um, and it's on the um, the Chewy Creek. Um, Duri is the, the Aboriginal word for it, but it's top end of there. But there was an incident there where um, my um, ancestors were involved in a um, confrontation with one of the um, pastorers and they actually um, um, for sheep stealing so they um, actually killed him there at Rockness, um, at Turi Creek, um, top of the end of Turi Creek and then what happened was that um, 
the police finally caught up with them at a um, place called um, Jabbagul, which is um, you know on the Ashburn River. Um, but they was um, caught up. They got caught there and then sent down to Watness Island. So it's my old um, grandmother's um, uncle, my grandfather, sorry, a um, bloke called Yangi. But uh, he was sent down to um, Watness Island. Um, and at that time there was um, a lot of Aboriginal people were in prison so you know you'd see images of people in their neck chains and being transported to Rottnest Island prison and it's a popular tourist resort but it's actually the valley of death for Aboriginal people and there's a book called The Rise and Glory of Rottnest Island which talks about the um, it's actually quite eerie but it talks about how Aboriginal people were treated there and that you know the superintendent there was actually he would do actually do public um public hangings and people would have to watch people hang um so it's a really um glory you know it was a very very traumatic piece of literature as, um, to read and but you know like that that history is not told at Rockness Island it's um, mm -hmm. it's you know promoted as uh, some you know wonderful tourist spot you'd go to and then recent, you know, some few years later, there's an um, article about, um, you know, late Robert Botha talked about how they found a reef of actually skulls, you know, so the prisoners, and many of them didn't come back, um, but they, they did, my family actually did come back, and um, they set them free, thinking that they wouldn't find their way back, but they actually found their way up, you know, back home. So imprisonment's so, really been part of the strategy of colonisation from the earliest days. Yes, that's mm. what, um, and um, it was the um, worst, you know, worst kind of imprisonment, you know, mm. like um, the, um, there was no, no, no justice system, mm. it, um, you know, people were free to um, treat Aboriginal people like, you know, like they said, you know, in some of the texts they talk, they talk about them as vermins, you know, people, you know, some pests you'd get rid of. And there was no um, no um, justice. There's, there was no court system, or you, know, you couldn't appeal against any of their treatment. Or, you know. And how yeah. do you see that history from the past being played out in the present? Well, in the in the present, um, um, currently now, we I think WA, WA has the highest imprisonment rate, um, and certainly um, there has been, um, you know, like in. Uh, in the region, a um, significant um, or you know alarming rate of imprisonment, mm. and you know we've got the um, you know death of the young girl that the mm. recent coroner, and if you look at her case, her re um, her thing was just a fine. It, it had it was a you know public fine in which she was you know she was going to be public disorder fine she'd be um, uh, imprisoned for, and um, and these are the th this, we see the, I suppose, the recycling of, um, um, you know, past treatments. It just, it just seems to come around. This, you know, you come back to the same spot where you started from. And uh, if you look in, like in the Pilbara, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Death and Custody actually started in Robin in 1985 with the death of the young fellow there. And he was 16 years old. He shouldn't have even been in the Robin locker. And um, they got acquitted. He was actually murdered by, in, in you know in the prison system. And um, but you know people who was responsible and charged for it, they actually they was acquitted. So we you know you and that's what one person told me. Well, if you want justice, you don't look for it in the Australian justice system. How so, could we mm. try and make a fairer justice system? What do you think would help? You know, to mm. stop this continual replay of history. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, the inquiry into you know Aboriginal death in custody was um, is and remains Australia's most significant social document. It you know cost um, something like one hundred forty million or thereabouts, um, but it made some um, key recommendations. And one of the you know the key recommendations um, was that um, even if they um, cut the um, you know the public disorder charges by a third. They would half their population because most of them are there for you know um, for public disorder offences. But 
also I think what is not happening in the um, in the social justice system is that they and they're dealing with the resultant effects of um, polarization and the, the you know the historical trauma associated with um, the displacement, dispossession of Aboriginal people from their traditional lands and the disintegration of Aboriginal culture. So you see now like a high level of family violence, um, you know, drug and alcohol. Um, those sort of issues are resultant effects of, um, of this, you know, dispossession. So we've, um, and what's not, the criminal justice system is not doing, is doing not enough to, do, to deal with the with the um, you know this um, systemic issues that deal that um, result in people's um, resenting problems, you know the homelessness, the unemployment, um, the poverty. Those are you know causes that you know place you know people in a position where they you know are more likely to um, you know deal with drugs and other antisocial mm. behaviour. Um, the loss of self and confidence, and, you know, lack of roles people play, and, um, and you know, the level of you know, unemployment is, is too high, and um, there's a lot of um, lot of trauma and stress in Aboriginal culture, and we have a very high mortality rate, and um, you know, you can't afford to have a you know like you can't afford to have a situation where um, people are constantly going to funerals because what it does to people's self, you know, emotional well-being is that it, it um, numbs people. They go, you know, experience, uh, you know, secondary post-traumatic stress syndrome mm. where, you know, people can't sleep, they, you know, can't feel any anything, and um, so they can't, you know, they can't um, connect. Um, to doing the, you know, to doing the right thing themselves when, you know, when you're in a state of um, stress and trauma all the time. Yeah. So you're really mm. highlighting a mm. very complex situation, mm. sort of underlying structural determinants of health and well-being, mm. sort of having access to, you know, decent living standards, mm. employment, um, mm. but also having trauma-informed services and policies, you know, and often it looks like policies actually exacerbate trauma <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the yeah, and then and the issues, you know, the, the having to deal with the issues of um, um, institutionalized racism. You know, mm. like when it's it's not blatant racism, but it's uh, the type of racism where you know the system itself is, you know, put these um, rules and conditions where you know you can't get access to services. And you know the key recommendation from the Royal Commission was actually exactly that. It was about how you know it's about improving services, um, basic services. So we're not talking about anything out of, out of the ordinary. Um, so Aboriginal people can you know have uh, access to services which you know can improve their standard of living and these um, social and economic positions. So um, th then that was one of the key recommendations. Of the Royal Commission was to, you know, for mainstream to, in a sense, improve the access, um, of, you know, culturally appropriate services for Aboriginal people, and you know, culturally appropriate services really do mean employing people with the cultural competencies, you know, the language skills, the um, community network skills, um, so people can, you know, um, be able to get the services they need to, mm. you know, to make the right choices. So it's it's really important for the justice system to look at how it works and do a better job, but other systems as well. You're talking mm. about health, mm. education, social mm. services. Mm. Well, we talk about, and, and we talk about you know like if you look at the um, incarceration, um, not just the rate of incarceration, but you look at the um, the when you know when um, children. Um, go through, end up in the criminal justice system and you know there's enough evidence actually in not just anecdotally but actually um, real that, uh, information that indicates that children that um, you know if you continue a high rem removal rate of children from their families like you know something like 40, 49 I think it's now 51% of Aboriginal children are in state care 
um, they, those children, there's a growing correlation between those that rate of children in the, that have been institutionalised as a result of child removal, and the ones that end up in the con and they just pro that's what people say. Oh, they just promote to you know to them. They just move systems when they get old. You know, when they mm. get of age, they just move into the criminal justice system. But so look, this incarceration rate actually starts at a very early age. It's for Aboriginal children, it starts you know seven, eight years of age, and it's just some you know it's a it's just a change from you know from a child protection system into a criminal justice system, and really that's not the choices you nobody would want those choices for your children. Mm -hmm. That's not you know they're not that's not a just or a fair mm -hmm. society because we all want our children to be. Well, we wouldn't want our children in the criminal, you know, in the child protection system first. But we don't want our children to end up in the criminal justice system either. So, um, what what would help to stop, you know, that removal of children? I think one of the well, one of the key, um, um, you know, the key um, factors in, involved is is that the um, um, child protection system itself, I think, needs to be. Um, well, I don't know if review is the right word, but they certainly need to go um, and look, because at the moment they're working on a child focus, so it's all about the child, you know, um, protection of the child. But at one stage, and you look at, and you look at this, you know, was um, um, Department of Community Development. When it was Department of Community Development, it did look at some of the, um, you know, like um, community work and the community development um, Work that needs to be done to improve um, families, you know, uh, social and economic position, so that the children can stay at home in a, in a relatively um, safe environment. Um, but um, it, the department changed its policy, and um, um, now I've just focus on the child, without looking at the family support systems that need to go in to support families, just you know, for the children to remain in their care. Um, the Aboriginal Placement Principle, which was, um, I think, a key recommendation also, um, has now um, is is not now a, um, a priority area. You know, they don't, you know, they're not getting enough foster carers. They don't have enough Aboriginal people that can um, qualify as um, carers of, you know, foster mm -hmm. carers or any carers of children, because the rules around the working with children's clearances and Police clearances don't just apply to the care; it applies for the whole household. And if you know a household is um, overcrowded, um, and there is, you know, um, you know, if you don't have a, you know, room set aside um, for children, which is clearly not the, is, you know, case when you live in an overcrowded condition. Everybody's mm. sort of got to share, um, mm. you know, their bed. Um, their sleeping arrangements, but it's, you know our child rearing system was a little bit um, more kinship based and um, more um, extended family focus. So everybody had a role to play in the you know caring of children. What under this new model now they have is it's all about based on um, a nuclear white middle class view that mm. you know children uh, remain in the you know primary care of. You know, you know, basically two people. So uh, child protection systems are not culturally safe. No, they don't. I was thinking they don't. Cult they don't cater for the cultural needs of mm. the child. Yeah. And, and, we, and that's you know, like there's a real worry up here because, whilst it might be fifty one percent state, you know, on average, that this that's the state um, figure. When we're talking about Aboriginal children in the pill, we're talking about ninety eight percent of their children that are in DCP care are Aboriginal children. And many of those children come from families where English is um, second or third language. So when they enter a um, child protection system, it's um, they go initially into a cultural shock, and that itself is very traumatic. And you know, I've been through, we've been through that process. And um, and when you, when you go into a um, you know one culture, you're literally going from one culture to another culture. And uh, you know, I've seen children where, and these are little ones. So we talk about two-year-olds that, you know, the only language and kin and kin of family they know is, um, is, um, you know, they, um, 
they, where they come from, their families, and you know, get a situation where they can't even talk to their caregiver. You know, they, they don't understand English, and the caregiver certainly don't understand their language. Mm. And so, you know, well, I just think that's you know, it's a really traumatic experience for any child to go through. Mm. And I think the fact that you know, children removing children. Um, once they know who they are, they are, you know, their identity and who their family are, I think is very traumatic. But I think it also um, creates that situation where they themselves become um, unwell, as not as you know, they start off being unwell and traumatic, and going, you know, being traumatized at a young age. But that trauma continues throughout their, you know, right through to their adult life. Mm. And um, they become dysfunctional adults, and, and definitely there is that, you know, that research that says that mm. children who've been brought up in institutionalised care in homes that are in out of home care is they are more likely to be end up in the criminal justice system. Mm. You know, there's a higher rate of them ending up in um, brought so, up in the you know the prison system. So who needs to be at the table in order to change these systems? You know, to make them. Um, more culturally safe, and also to you know stop the the beginnings of the pathway into mm -hmm. incarceration. Who needs to be at the table, you know, to make those changes? Um, well, all the all the support system for us, you know, the housing, education system, you know, the Aboriginal leadership, um, the child protection agencies. They all need to be at the table together. But what what we got is every department is working independently and doing their own, you know, they, and they don't have this um, common goal, and you know, what and what would be, you know, what is the vision of the criminal justice system? Is is their vision to reduce people from, you know, being caught up in the criminal justice system, or is that, or is it, you know, is their goal is to increase their uh, incarceration rate? You know? Yeah. Um, what what is their vision goal? Well, we have a new <coughs> prime minister and some new ministers at a federal level. Mm. How how could they step up on this issue? I think the um, how I think they should step up. Well, um, I think um, there should be a lot more um, services um, um, to um, improve Aboriginal people's. Um, um, you know, their, their social, economic, and situations, but all for them to, to, um, to you know, to look at how children come into into the state system, and a lot of the, some of the um, the entry into the state system has to do with their um, their policies and um, programs um, that are initially designed to to assist Aboriginal people. Uh, you know, had a situation like we've had a situation. I like worked at the Kilbera Indigenous Women's Group, and initially we had the um, role um, to um, provide support services to Aboriginal women. You know, there's been a big change in Aboriginal family structure. Um, from you know, now we see more and more single parents family system. You know, I've been a single parent myself. And a lot of it um, got to do with the dysfunction and the, um, you know, of the um, family. You know, the family itself is um, um, not coping. So, um, but um, we had that, you know, the funding support for, to provide the support services. But the government is constantly changing their programs. So. You know, the, like the Indigenous Women's Program was a 12-month funding and was an absolute minimum funding. Um, you might be, um, so that a lot of the funding is really set up to um, so that you know organisations actually do fail. Mm. And it's minimal. It was only 90,000, but within a matter of time, they actually changed their they, their bureaucrats in Canberra decided, oh well, we don't want Indigenous Women's Program anymore, so they changed it to um, a leadership program. And it, but it was still 12 months funding, and you can't do anything on a 12 month funding, um, or you know, the chances of you doing anything and sustaining your institutions and organisations to, to provide these um, services, um, you can't do it on a 12 month funding. Um, but that's that's how they that's that's what government does. They mm. change the goalposts, they change rules, 
the change of policies. So in a sense, they you get the impression anyways, do you, that, well, they really don't want us to, you know, do, do well. They really don't want us to get um, make some, you know, changes here. Um, mm. So we've, you know, that's one of the, one of the thing. Another thing is that we've got the decision making doesn't happen in, in, on the ground. It's all, you know, top down, uh, made by bureaucrats and people that have no understanding, no, in ca some cases they don't even know where South Headland is. They've got no idea about the community, they've got, you know, no idea what the cost mm. is, um, but they make the decisions. So, you know, these people have, a, you know, um, have the, um, I suppose, um, influence and um, they have nearly, all, you know, they have the prime, well, all the decision making, um, but they're making that decision without, um, the, you know, the proper um, mm -hmm. informed knowledge about um, those people that they're making decisions about. So you need much more localised decision making, much more secure long term funding, mm -hmm. and much more responsive to what the community actually needs and wants. Yeah, I think that the other thing is that I think there is. Um, um, I, this is what I believe there is an anti-social contract between Aboriginal people and, and the government in respect to how you know the funding um, is um, the con you know the contract of funding, and you know we've seen that with the Northern Territory intervention, you know where we have clearly you know clear racist policies and um, um, driving what you know that's the type of services Aboriginal people get and I know that's not happening to any any other minority group in, in Australia these um, exceptions exemptions from the racial discrimination acts you know the government is allowed you know to go and exempt themselves from being un under that act in order to um, deliver uh, you know uh, some kind of very aggressive hostile service model to Aboriginal people and um, without any real consultation with Aboriginal people, and mm. and we see the same picture again, like with the you know this constitutional reform, um, they've you know done the consultation, but they they I don't know what the situation now with this now with the new change with the um, government, but you, you know the fact that you have to fight for a basic consultation process, indigenous consultation process, so you can get to the root of the, you know, some of the key in the issues. Um, and it's not just for our benefit, but it's for their benefit. So, you know, they don't spend and waste precious dollars on a, on a, on a model that's going to, um, well, in a sense, fail, not just for us, but for Aboriginal people, um, but for, you know, for their, for their government. It's just wasting people's money. But they, you know, you have to even fight for a basic consultation process yes. and, and yet it's it's about us it's about you know how do you include Aboriginal people in the into the Australian Constitution but they don't want to consult with us this it's just it don't make sense it's not it's not rational to be to think like that you know and it comes to this thing about you know like well this anti-social contract then because mm. that's that's what basically it's about so when you um call it the anti-social contract could you just I mean that's such a powerful term so mm. is it what are you saying there that the government is really um, you know it's doing the opposite of what it claims to be doing when it um, is providing policy or services to Aboriginal people yes yeah basically what, what, I'm, what I was saying yeah what I'm saying is that um, um, what I'm saying is that the um, government um, is continuing with the, um, um, con you know, their um, colonial policies of the past, where it um, designed to bring harm and injury to Aboriginal people. Um, it's you know, some of these policies, uh, especially if you look at Centrelink policy, it's not not really there to help them, you know, to get into jobs or improve their social economic thing. It's to punish them. For being unemployed or not working, um, and it it's directed mostly at Aboriginal people because we know that um, you know even though they like to think that they um, that is that is all you know above board, we know when they target specific 
postcodes or locations uh, where Aboriginal people predominantly live, uh, we know that it's, it's very much to do with this um, disenfranchisement and disengagement with the, with the people that they claim they are acting in the best interest of. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, yeah. so, that's what they do, they pick on postcodes or they pick a postcode mm -hmm. and they know we use a predominantly, you know, an Aboriginal population mm -hmm. and they apply that policy in, to that area. Mm. And then you say, well, it's not discriminatory. We're not discriminating. We're not, you know, like we know that those things are targeted towards and I guess what groups. Weaves all this together with the Just Justice um, project is that idea of, you know, racially based profiling or policies or discriminatory treatment. You know, which actually, as you say, it's doing harm, and the justice system is not providing justice mm. at present for mm. Aboriginal people. Mm. Yeah, and, and then when I say anti, um, you know, anti-social meaning, you know, it's just the fact that you know, you know, your basic sociology is that you know, like we're social beings. Everybody has to work and live and um, together in order to, for all of us to, you know, to benefit or you know, at least have a decent life. And but this is the opposite. It's almost like they don't want to. And, you know, they prefer Aboriginal people are left on the margins and not really included in, into the, um, you know, equal opportunity of... Um, what, what might change that? What might be helpful in changing that dynamic? Um, well, what, what I think what we've been all been fighting for, you know, that is, you know, the issue of that equality. Mm. And, and it is about the issue about recognising in a genuine way, you know, the Indigenous um, sovereignty, you know, it, it is about recognising that these, um, that they, and you know, like Paul Keating was saying, they, they committed these atrocities um, and they need to fix them. Mm -hmm.